started before it gets too hot in here? Who wants to get started before it's too hot in here? Raise your hand. I don't know why this happens, but I hear my breath. Is that better? Can you hear my breath like that? Okay. Raise your hand if you can hear me. service time. Yeah, so just put it on your calendar. Don't show up at whenever you show up this morning, you know, nine, nine o'clock. Is that what time we already start now? Yeah. 10 o'clock. You get to sleep in a little. Okay, that's the one service and we head out to the park for the big annual picnic. So open your Bibles to the book of Amos. Hopefully you have a, a copy of the uh, some, uh Message notes, you can follow along. Some of the main points are there listed for you. We also have the blue book. If you got the blue book, raise it up high so people can see it. Right over there. Look around. Okay. If you don't have that, those are, those are like the, the workbook that goes along with the series. Pick one up on your way out, but bring that one back and make it yours. Put your name in it. Really helpful stuff to go over. Um, let's just jump in and pray, and then we'll uh, open the word to uh, look at the book of Amos. So, Father, we, we need you to open our eyes and hearts and minds so that we might really understand what you have to tell us today through this book. It's been around for centuries, but still is so practical for us today. Father, we pray that you, as the only source of life and light and love and peace, would just fill this place. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters over in the Middle East today, that you would, we know that the Christians, both Israeli Christians and Arab Christians, Father, they've got a their hands full with being your hands and feet over in that place that's so torn up with war and strife and chaos. We pray that you would work through your people and your church to reach people who need you, Father, because you are the Prince of Peace, and only you can bring peace, lasting peace to anyone, to any nation. So, God, we pray for them today. You would encourage them. We pray for those lives, that many lives would be spared, Father, just the senselessness of what's going on, that you would be... Uh, doing your work through your church and through your Holy Spirit. We pray all these things together. We say amen. So, uh, we started a series last Sunday, a collection of books we're looking at in the Old Testament that is oftentimes overlooked. Uh, how many remember what the, who are the minor prophets? Why they're called the minor prophets? They're short in length. Okay. They're very important, just as important, but they just get to this, the message. They get to the point quickly. It's not because they're under the age of 18 or anything like that. It's just, you know, they're, they're really powerful. And often, as you read through the prophets, many of them were written after Israel. God's people had turned, its, Israel had turned its back on God. And through them, God lays out a plan forward, a plan of restoration, pointing to a coming Messiah who would heal and restore and redeem all of their sin had stolen and messed up. And so we, if you're ever caught in a sin pattern or you need to be restored, a lot of times the minor prophets have a lot of helpful instruction. And so, uh, again, uh, there were a lot of prophets. If you take a notes, write this down. I hope you realize this. There were a lot of prophets used by God in the Old Testament, many more than we have record of. But God chose to record these books and pass them on to us because there's still something for us to learn from their story and from their testimony, right? It wasn't just written for them. The ones that found themselves in our Bible today are there for us as well, and we can glean from them. And that's what we're asking God to do during this series. So today we're going to look at who arguably just might be the most unpopular of all the prophets in Israel. So write that down. Probably the most unpopular. And his name is uh, Amos. Not to be concerned, not to be confused with, uh, you know, the cookie guy. He's the, not, he's the not so famous Amos. And it's sad that a guy that is known for cookies is more famous than this Amos. But that's another s story. So he wasn't a professional prophet. Here's some background if you're taking notes. He, was, he didn't make his living 
as many of the prophets did, were supported by the nation of Israel to prophesy. He, he was a lay prophet, not professional. He was a shepherd, and he was a farmer of the fig. He was a fig tree farmer, as we read in, the, in his book, nine chapters long, who lived in a place called Tekoa. Say Tekoa with me. Tekoa, a small town 10 miles south of Jerusalem. He preached during the 8th century B.C., at that time, Israel had been now over about 150 years before his time, it had split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Israel was known as the northern kingdom. At this time, he was ruled by King Jerob it was ruled by King Jeroboam, and Az Uzziah was the king of the southern kingdom, Judah, at this time of the writing of Amos. Uh, now, Jeroboam was a successful military leader. Write that down. He was very successful militarily. He'd won lots of battles, had extended Israel's territory, in fact. At this time, Israel was still uh, surging from the prosperity that they had gained and enjoyed under King David and Solomon. And Jeroboam was you know, pretty sharp and pretty, you know, uh, clever when it came to making money and bringing prosperity. And so the nation of Israel at this time was both unchallenged both in, dom in military strength and power and financial resources. They were experiencing a very good com uh, economy, very prosperous time, very peaceful time. And yet, now here's why he's unpopular. At that time, when everything seems to be going straight, uh, great and, and, power and wonderful, God calls Amos to travel north to a place called Bethel, an important city in the northern uh, kingdom, to tell them to repent. Wait. Repent of what? I mean, we're, we're, we're winning. We're, we're winning this thing, right? Uh, but he says you've got to repent because God's judgments are coming. And now here, if you look at the text, the first couple of chapters, you think, okay, this is a, a, a judgment against Israel. But he, he starts with judging Israel's neighbors. Okay, this is really important to understand. He starts with all of Israel's neighbors, the surrounding nations, because they were guilty too of all kinds of sin, and, th and therefore they were headed for destruction. So Amos starts off, you know, condemning, judging the surrounding nations around Israel. Now, if you're an Israelite and you're starting to hear this message, what are you thinking off the bat? Who's he going after? Not us. Keep that in mind. And so in these, look at this, Damascus is mentioned. It's in the northeast. Gaza, which is in the news, right? The, that's the Philistine capital. Uh, in the southwest, you have uh, Tyre, which were the Phoenicians. In the north, uh, excuse me, Ga Gaza was in the southwest. Tyre is in the northwest. Edom and Moab in the southeast. Ammon to the east and Judah to the south. Those are the, those are the, uh, the nations he's judging. And in each of those judgments, he starts off with this same refrain. You notice it? What does it say? In verse uh, 3, 6, 9, 11... 13, chapter 2, verse 1. What is it? For? Okay, mine says for three transgressions and for four. Now, you know, that's, that's but it's basically it's just being translated out of the Hebrew. So, but think about it. It's the same phrase. Now, does that mean literally three or four? No, it's a poetic way of saying a whole, all kinds of sins. And then it's interesting. He doesn't list four or three or four. He just lists one, that kind of, one or two that kind of symbolize all of their problems right and so it's really we're not going to spend time on that it's kind of an overview fly over kind of thing uh, that we're kind of getting our you know taste for the book so here's taking notes uh, it means multiple sins these people were guilty of here's some of them chapter 1 verse 3 cruelty against other people cruelty uh, selling people into slavery chapter 1 verses 6 and 9 anger and wrath leading up to murder Chapter 1, verse 11. And then in verse 13, genocide. Just wiping people out, babies and everyone included. Desecration of the dead, chapter 2, verse 1. And then for Judah, he gets to Judah last, right? Because Judah was, uh, you know, connected in a way to the northern kingdom. Uh, they get chastised or judged because they rejected God's law and they got involved in idolatry, chapter 2, verse 4. Now, again, you can almost hear the crowd at Bethel all nodding their heads going, preach it, brother. 
They like those messages, right? Because who are they? Who's he going after? All their enemies. And by the way, write this down. Everybody likes to hear about judgment on their enemies, right? I mean, Mark Dever says one of the fastest ways to build a friendship with someone is to complain together about the same people. Sad but true. Now, Amos is actually kind of setting them up. Because if you look at that map, and I want you to picture that, he's going all just kind of in this general area. Who's going to be in the crosshairs, the bullseye of the target? Who's in the middle of all that? Israel. And so for a couple of chapters, he talks about their neighbors, but for seven chapters, he launches in. This is what your problem is, Israel. This is what God's upset about, Israel, what you're doing, Israel. And uh, it's, pre it's pretty amazing. For three transgressions of Israel, chapter 2, verse 6, look at it. Or, uh, uh, and for four. And I can just imagine them going, wait, what? <laughs> You're talking to us now? These warnings are about coming financial disaster and about military destruction. The two things they were priding themselves in. Right? And it just seemed utterly unrealistic, actually unbelievable to them. But 30 years later, it was, it was coming, but it was a slow grind. It finally happened. Now, Amos spends the next, again, seven chapters. That's three times more space and time on Israel's guilt than on any of the others that he judges. And uh, think about this. The Bible says judgment begins at the house of God. And in chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, notice this. The archer will not stand his ground. Now, the archer was the, the military guy, the, the warrior, right? That's... In fact, it says, and he who is stout of heart among the mighty men shall flee away naked in that day, declares the Lord. Uh, one commentator I read this week said, Israel's archers at that time were a source of national pride. So saying, quote, they will flee away naked in that day would be like saying to us, your Navy SEALs will collapse into the fetal position and cry for their mommies. And I'm sure they didn't want to hear that. They couldn't believe it, many of them. Chapter 3, verse 15, look at this. He says, I will strike the winter house along with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, declares the Lord. So they think they're doing really well financially. They're living the high life. And God says, I mean, notice these people had nice houses. They, both, they had both summer houses and winter houses. They felt pretty secure from all financial disaster. And so this was hard for them to believe. But strong nations and individual lives oftentimes do, do not come apart because of outside pressures or financial problems or military disasters. Nations and individuals are oftentimes, more often than not, brought down from corruption from within. And that is what's happening in Israel. And that's what happens all the time. It, it, it's probably happening right now in our country. You see, Jeroboam had generated lots of wealth for Israel. And with it comes what? Pride and immorality and decadence. Israel's wealth had led to apathy. Listen, watch this progression. Their wealth led to apathy. And it then allowed, then it then allowed for idol worship for the God, of the gods of Canaan. Right? They kind of loosened their what they believed, and they started adopting the ways of the world around them, which in turn led to this injustice and the neglect of the poor and the oppression of the weak, which is a big part of Amos' judgment, uh, God's judgment through Amos on the, this people. Now think about this. Why did worship of false gods lead to injustice and oppression and neglect of the poor because that's the kind of gods they were worshiping. They're, those false gods could care less about the people that God cares about. Here's some specific reasons, by the way, why judgment was coming to Israel. Let, let me just write, read, read this out, make the note. Chapter 2, verse 8. Now, this is why God's judging Israel. Again, sexual immorality. Notice what he says in chapter 2, verse 8. Amos calls out their, part, their participation with, this, it, with the sexuality of their culture. What's it say? He, what's he say? A man and his father 
go into the same girl. They have sex with the same girl so that my holy name is profane. They're passing people around as sex, sex objects, mirroring their culture at that time. Rejecting God's word through the prophets, chapter 2, verse 12. Look at this. They're rejecting God's word sent through God's prophets. He said, I raised up some of your sons for prophets. But you commanded the prophet saying, you shall not prophesy. He said, now think about this. So after I delivered you, God says, you didn't want to know what I would have to say to you. After I delivered you out of Egyptian captivity, after I delivered you from your foes and enemies in the promised land, you now turn your back on me, don't want to hear what I have to say. I mean, if you could trust me, if you could trust me to save your life, why can't you trust me to guide your life? Do you see how this is appropriate for us today to ask these questions of ourselves? Are we allowing God to guide us? Every moment, every day, every hour, every moment. Uh, chapter 2, verse 7 says they were ignoring and becoming apathetic toward those who suffered. Notice they trampled the head of the poor into the dust. They trampled the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turned aside the way of the afflicted. They had lives of ease, comfort, and luxury, and they didn't care about those right around them in their own communities who were suffering, who were being neglected, who were being oppressed. In fact, they were oppressing them themselves. Notice this, verse 6, I already mentioned that the other people were doing this. They were selling people. They were selling themselves, their own people, into slavery. Look at chapter 2, verse 6. They sell the righteous for what? For silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. You say, wait. They, they swap people for a, you know, a pair of sandals. No, what, what they're talking about is they exploited the poor. Write this down. They were exploiting the people they could take advantage of. Lending to them, you know, at exorbitant rates, calling in the debts. And in that day, you could not declare bankruptcy, right? There, I don't know how many people in our country, maybe in this group, you know, declared bankruptcy, get a fresh air. You couldn't do that. You had to pay. If you couldn't pay, you had to be sold into servitude to pay off your debt. So it wasn't like, oh, one pair of sandals is worth this guy. But they were, they were spending money, being charged interest, not being able to pay, and as a result, being sold into slavery or ser servitude. And God's ticked. That shouldn't be happening. Right? And then, possibly the most frustrating sad, and sad part in all of this, Amos says, check, check out chapter 5. Look at verses 21 and 23. Okay, so th would those things be upsetting, you think, to God? They are upsetting to God. But here's the kicker. Maybe most frustrating of all. They did all of this, they were doing all of this while they were remaining fervent in their religious devotion. You know, it's one thing to go, okay, I'm just a cutthroat kind of guy. But when that's connected with someone who says, but I love Jesus and I'm, I'm you know, justifying all their behavior under the cloak of religiosity, that's sickening. And notice what God says. He says as much himself. He says, I, what? Verse 21, 521. I, what? Hate. Say it really loud. Hate. Let's do it at one, two, three. <laughs> one, two, three. Hate. I mean, it's, you should go through, it would be a good study sometime to look at the Bible. You know, you can do this on a computer probably. All the times hate is mentioned, God saying he hates something. He loves a lot of things, but he hates some things too. This is one of them. He hates what? He goes on, it's not just enough to say one time. He goes, I hate, I despise your feasts, your religious feasts. And I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not what? I won't accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take them away, take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of the harps, I will not listen. Think about what that means. It means when people come before God, when they were coming before God, living a life of trusting in anything but God and taking advantage of other people around them, doing injustice, 
they come and they sing songs of praise, God says, man, shut up. Take that stuff away. It's noise. So they come to church and sing God's praises, but their hearts are somewhere else entirely altogether, someplace else. A.W. Tozer said, Christians don't tell lies, they usually sing them. Wow. So here's God's concern on your ally, just kind of drilling down on this. If you're taking notes, I'd write the irony, right? The irony of all this. These are the very people who once were denied justice themselves, enslaved in Egypt. Those whom God had rescued from oppression and slavery, now they're enslaving others, acting just like the people God freed them from. And God says in chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, I was, it was I who destroyed the Amorites before you. I brought you up out of the land of Egypt, right? I led you for 40 days in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. I mean, after all that I've done to free you from a culture like that, you are becoming that culture. You are, you know, uh, just melting into that culture. And you're ignoring all, what, all those things I've done for you. And you're taking up the very same things I saved you from. Check, check out chapter 3, verse 2. He says, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Let that sink in. God's saying, you're the only one I showed special treatment for. So you go, that's good. Yeah, but he says, therefore, uh-oh, because with great privilege comes what? You saw Spider-Man too, right? I think that was in the first Spider-Man, right? With great privilege comes great responsibility. That's a biblical, you know, truth, actually. That's what he says. Look at chapter 3, verse 2. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, you know better, right? You know much better. You should know better. I will punish you for all your iniquities. He's saying, in other words, that makes your sin even worse. Because you not only knew me as lawgiver, you knew me as father, as redeemer. Jesus said it this way, to whom much is given, much will be required, much will be expected. If we've really been forgiven, we'll be more passionate about these things, not less passionate about helping people and, uh, and, and giving our lives to help other people and freeing people from oppression and being the hands and feet of God in this world today. See, Israel had a great calling, which came with great responsibility, and so their sin and rebellion brings greater consequences. Amos is saying, a failure to show concern for the poor and the downtrodden and the oppressed shows we've never realized our own pressing need for God's mercy towards us. Jesus says it this way in Matthew 25, you know, the scene of the, the sheep and the goats being separated. And, and, God, and, and God, and Jesus says to, to one group that comes before him, depart from me, I never knew you. Why? Why? Because when I was thirsty and hungry and naked and needing shelter, you what? You blew me off. You ignored me. And he's saying here, Mo, uh, Amos is saying, the way, it's not the way we have a relationship. In other words, you don't do those things in order to get a relationship with God. But if you have a relationship with God, the result will be doing those things. It moves you. If you have a real dynamic faith, a real life faith in God and the relationship with God, it will wake you up to look around and see the world as God sees the world. Because who's living in you now? Last week, it was the greatest privilege they received, Joel said. The Spirit of God is given to you, right? To abide with you. And so if you have the Spirit of God living in you, you'll start seeing the world as God sees it. And if you don't see the world as God sees it, you got to ask yourself, do you know God? Have you experienced the gospel? Tim Keller said Karl Marx famously called Christianity the opiate, right? The opiate of the masses, the opiate of the people. He says, but really Christianity is more like the smelling salts. How many of you had to ever use smelling salts with someone? 
You know what those are? Those are the things you break open, you, you know, they wake up. Christianity is like that. When God comes into your life, it wakes you up, and now you can finally see things as you should be seeing them, as God sees them. Amos, and here's, here's the pivotal verse, I think, of Amos' book. Amos 4.24, kind of the middle of the book. It kind of leads up to this, and then, you know, everything comes out of it. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That's why we sang the first song this morning, right? Let mercy run like a wild river or river wild or something. Is that how we said it? Yeah. That's right out of Amos chapter 5, verse 24. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Circle those two words. They're key words in Amos and in the entire Old Testament, in fact, in the entire Bible. Justice and righteousness. They're super important. Righteousness. Write this down if you're taking notes. You want a definition. This refers to a standard of right and equitable relationships between people. When you're righteous with someone, you're doing the right thing by them. You're being fair with them, right? Being in right standing with them. Right and equitable standing between people. No matter what social differences exist between you. That's righteousness. Justice refers to concrete actions that you take to correct injustice and create righteousness. In other words, where there is no righteousness, justice corrects that. Justice comes in and changes things concretely, doing things, not just thinking about it, not just praying about it, but actively doing something about it. So that both of these are to permeate the life of God's people. How? In what way does it look like? Chapter 5, verse 24 again, let it roll down like waters. It's kind of like, like a rushing stream fills a dry riverbed. Can you imagine that? There's nothing, it's dry, it's desolate, and all of a sudden it just comes rushing in. That's the kind of change that God makes in someone's life. Not just something we talk about or think about or pray about. It's actually evidence in our, how we live our lives and how it impacts other people around us. The word justice there, mishpat, right? M-I-S-H-P-A-T -S in the Hebrew. It occurs over 200 times in the Old Testament. And when you see it, it typically, you typically see it uh, in, relationship, in relationship to four classes of people. Four classes of people are usually connected with it. Write these down if you're taking notes. Widows, orphans, foreigners, and the poor. That's widows, orphans, foreigners, and the poor. One scholar calls it the quartet of the vulnerable. So God equates doing justice as caring for the most vulnerable among us. Deuteronomy 10.18, God executes justice, or mishpat, for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the sojourner, the foreigner, giving him food and clothing. Leviticus 23, there was a cleaning law. You remember what the cleaning law was in Leviticus? When God says, you're going to go into the promised land, it's going to be fruitful, you're going to have all, everything you need. When you tend your fields, don't gather to the very edges. Leave some margin. And don't go over the field twice. Guess what? You'll have plenty. You'll have more than enough. And if you're wise, you'll build storehouses for all that I'm going to bless you with. So don't, don't overwork the land. Leave some margin and leave, and don't go over twice for, and that was his system of workfare. It wasn't welfare. It was workfare. Because the poor among them could then glean, right, the edges and have sustenance and they could live and probably have enough to live on and probably do pretty well. In fact, read the book of Ruth, right? Ruth, that's how she survived. She was a gleaner. And so uh, God says, don't go over twice. I'll bless you. But in Amos's day, as it is in our day, it's easy for God's people to live in luxury while others around us are suffering. Christians, on average, Christians, those who say, I'm a follower of Jesus, give out of their resources here in America about 2.4% of their income to God's work. 
A lot don't give anything. Most Christians in America, that means, don't even tithe. Tithe is giving the first tenth. Of ten things, God gives you all everything. God says, take one, of, one tenth of that and just return it to me and trust me. Actually, studies show the richer one gets, the less percentage-wise one gives. One study revealed that those making less than $45,000 a year are twice as likely to be tithing as those who make more than $150,000. 1 Timothy 6, 6, 6, 17 says this in 18. As for the rich in this present age, don't tune out. Don't say, I'm not rich. I'm no, Joe, I'm no Bill Gates. You know, I'm no Zuckerberg or whoever you want to, uh, uh, Buffett. That, everyone who lives in America, according to the Bible standard, is filthy rich. For, as for the rich in this present age, that's us, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything, what? To enjoy. God is no ogre in the sky wanting you not to enjoy the things he blesses you with. No, he says enjoy, and yet don't hog it. Don't hoard it. Enjoy it. He says, it goes on, he says, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Enjoy it and share it. Proverbs 14, 31. He who oppresses the poor shows a contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. So many, many of the missions we support help people who don't have a lot in different parts of the world, even here in our own community. But that doesn't mean just the church does it. It means we as individuals need to be involved in that and asking God, God, how can I be your hands and feet? How can I be... Someone through whom mercy and righteousness flows to others. Uh, Proverbs 14, 31. Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. I, I read that. Whoever is kind to the needy honors God. And then Proverbs 21, 13. Now keep in mind, this is written by the richest man of his day, Solomon. If a man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor... He, too, will cry out and not be answered. There's a whole long list. We don't have time. That's another sermon of reasons why your prayers, my prayers, sometimes aren't answered. But I'll tell you, uh, one of the many reasons why sometimes prayer isn't answered is found right here in Proverbs 21. I guess I, we have to wonder, don't we? How many times we pray and don't get answered is because of this thing that's one of these things that's on that list, we shut our ears. La, 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 la. <laughs> to the cries of the poor, deciding it's somebody else's responsibility or they're not worthy of our help. Proverbs 29, 7. Are, is anyone getting convicted by, by this time, by the way? Okay. Me too. <laughs> the righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. Proverbs 31, 8. Speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Who? The vulnerable. For the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge equitably or fairly, right? Justice, justly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. And so let me just give you a quick thing that would, might be helpful instruction. Always give to God and always give to those in need off the top. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Give to the Lord the second fruits, the fourth fruits. What's it say? First fruits. Give God the first fruits. And let me say, just the first check that Sharon and I have written since we got married in, 40, in, 40, in 1942, that was a long time ago, ah, 42 years ago, not that long ago, but 42 years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it feels like that sometimes. Uh, was give God first. Now, the thing, what was really cool, one of the things that I think attracted us to each other is we both were trying to serve God, and we were both already tithing. So it was not, not a big problem, no brainer. We're going to, oh, yeah, of course we're going to give God off the top. We've been doing that for 42 years, and we've been able, by God's grace, to increase that just because he's good, and he, he's trustworthy, he's faithful. And many of you know this because you're doing it, but some of you haven't yet, and I encourage you to take the challenge, take the, take the risk, jump in. He is faithful. Um, because here's the deal. If you don't give to God off the top and you give to him 
only out of the leftovers, you soon find oftentimes there are no leftovers. Have you ever noticed that? And so it's an incredibly important uh, principle to incorporate, incorporate into your life. So question before we move on. Which direction is your money taking you today? Just think about it. Pray about it. Maybe write it down. Think, pray over it this week. Is it taking you away from pain and suffering and inconvenience? Or is it drawing you deeper into helping be the hands and feet of Jesus in those situations where desperately people need help? In fact, this is so cool. I got to chapter, write this verse down. Amos 5, 4. Just write it down. And then Amos 5, uh, four, Amos 5, 6 together says this. God says, seek me and live. In other words, what's he saying? If you seek him, you're going to get what? Life. Chapter, chapter 5, verse 10. Just a few verses down. Look at what it says. Chapter 10. Compare those two things in chapter four, 5, verses 4 and 6 to chapter 5, verse 10. I'm excuse me. Verse 14. It's 10 verses away. That's why I'm there. 10 verses down in verse 14. It says this. Seek God, not evil, and live. So what does that mean? It means, I think it hit me between the eyes and saying, you know what? When I'm seeking to do the right, doing the right good, I'm really trying to do the good, God connects with that so much. He's saying, basically, when you seek really the good of someone else, and that can only be done if God's living in you, right? That's understood. Then you're really seeking life, and you're going to experience life. In other words, seeking God and seeking good that comes out of knowing God, they go to hand hand in hand, together. They're that tied up. Now, some respond well to God's judgments, and others, not so much. In fact, I'm, I'm hoping you're encouraged by this and not like going, I can't wait to get out of here. Uh, but Amos's voice wasn't the only one heard in his day. There was another preacher, a make-you-feel-good preacher named Amaziah. Look at chapter 7, verse 10. Amaziah opposes Amos. And chapter 7, verse 10, says this. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, went, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. So he convinces Jeroboam to banish Amos. Now, think about this. This guy is a priest. And he's saying, this guy, he's, he's, keep, you know, he's messing up the, the good thing we got going here. He's, he's saying, you're not doing the right thing. He's saying, you're, God's judgment is coming against us. That's scary, folks, when pastors or preachers say the exact opposite of what God wants them to say. And there will be those ready to tell our generation whatever our generation wants to hear. Right? We've kind of talked about that recently. 2 Timothy 4 says this, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to what? Suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And folks, that's why at this church we're committed to teaching the Bible. If we let God's word guide us, we'll hear not only what we like to hear, but also sometimes what we don't like to hear, like maybe today. <laughs> we will share both the popular parts of the, of the Bible and the unpopular parts, the comforting and the offensive parts of the Bible. We will, as people who come on this platform to open God's word and teach from God's word, we strive to give words that fill us with hope, and the ones that fill us with anger and everything in between. Because we don't just, oftentimes, you know, we're looking at a book of Bible right now. We, we take the Bible and go, what does it say? And it's so good just to keep a healthy balance between the Bible. Because you can focus on a few verses out of context and get all whacked in your understanding. And so, Amos' vision, real quickly, we're almost done. But I just, I put this in because in chapter 7 and 8 and 9, 
there are these this series of visions, and they're pretty interesting. But they all kind of undergird what we've, all been, we've been talking about over the last few minutes together. Uh, chapter 7, verse 1, talks about the swarm of locusts. We saw that in Joel, right? God's coming, bringing judgment, bringing punishment. Chapter 7, verse 4, a fire. Seven, ch- chapter 7, verse 8, a plumb line. God has a plumb line, a standard, and says, man, you guys are so off the track. You're so off the, the degrees. God is here, and you're way over here. He has a plumb line. He's judging. And then chapter 8, verse 1, a basket of summer fruit. That means overly ripe fruit. Uh, you know how over, overripe fruit is? If you look at it, it might look fine. But you touch it, and you taste it, and it's not fine. It looks good on the outside, but it's, it's starting to fall apart inside. And he's basically saying, that's you guys. You look good on the outside. Prosperity, military strength. Not so good. And then lastly, chapter 9, verse 1. There's a terrible scene where God is shaking up the pillars. Probably of the temple or, or their foundations. Kind of busting things up. In other words, God's not happy. And that leads us to the last point this morning. God is committed to us. And that's why he shares the hard word with us. That's why he shares the tough truth with us through his word. See, it isn't until the final paragraph of the book, right? Nine chapters long, the last paragraph of chapter nine finally has a glimmer of hope. How many of you want some hope this morning? Okay, here it is. Uh, It's not until the final chapter that we get a glimmer of hope. He picks up this image. Amos picks up the image of Israel as a destroyed building that God has shaken up. And here's what he says. Out of the ruins one day, the house that's been shaken now because of your sin will be restored. Look at chapter 9, verse 11. In that day, God says, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins. And I will rebuild it as it used to be. Chapter uh, 9, verse 14. I will bring my people Israel back from exile. Because they're going to be out of the land. And he's referring to the fact that one day he's going to bring the future messianic king from David's line. Right? Jesus, as we know him today. And he will rebuild the family of God's people. The real house of David, right? The real house of David. Is God's people for eternity, made up of both Jews and Gentiles. The book of Galatians talks about this. And he'll rebuild the family of God's people, which will surprisingly to the Israelites, will include people outside of Israel. Now, Amos refers to the day of the Lord five times, by the way. Five times, that phrase, the day of the Lord. And it's always a day of judgment, right? But the good news is this, in the New Testament, the day of the Lord that the minor prophets talked about began with the death of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection. (laughs) Because there, the judgment we deserved was poured out on who? Jesus. And because of that, if we will humble ourselves and genuinely seek God and live, right? Seek God, then we can find safety in God. Because safety is found in nothing else and no one else. Be praying for the Middle East. Be praying for your neighborhood. Be praying for your family. Peace is only found in Jesus and how we need him. So, Father, in this time, when we come around your table to remember the price Jesus paid by taking our sins on himself so that we don't have to die, we can live as we seek you and your face in in the person of your son Jesus today. Help us see him more clearly maybe than ever before today. Help us to return to you if we've strayed. Help us to repent and turn our backs on the the way we've been walking. And today, Father, we re-up with you. We recommit to you. Even during this time, we, we set aside to appreciate the death of Jesus on the cross and what he did. And that he didn't stay dead. And we celebrate the resurrection. Because, Father, as we sang earlier, you You picked us up. You turned us around. You placed our feet on solid ground. You healed our hearts. You changed our names. Wow. Forever free. We're not the same. And so we thank you. We thank you. During this time, we remember what you did. And for those of you this morning who might be here 
or watching from home, listening to what we've looked at in the book of Amos. If you haven't yet trusted Jesus today, what's keeping you from trusting him today? Just start that relationship. Start that conversation by saying, Jesus, as much as I know how, I want to I want to know you. And if you would just give us the honor, the privilege of knowing about that, we'd love to come alongside you and help you just take those steps as you enter that relationship with him, as you, as you seek him. Father, we seek you today. May you, be, may you be known by every single person who has a heart to seek you today. Thank you for Amos and the, the truths we learn. Help us to apply them. Show us how to apply them this week in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name.